Uh, Kitty, are you there by any chance? Okay. Oh, there. Okay. Ready. Uh, um, you ready to start letting people in, and then we'll uh, thirty seconds, and I'll start doing the intro. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'll start letting people in now. Yep. All right. Um, so hello, everyone who's joined so far. We'll get started in just a moment. Um, just waiting for everyone to log on. Hello, everyone who just joined. We'll get started in just a second. Um, well, while people are coming in, uh, I can at least start doing the intro. So uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our program tonight, A History of Wampanoag Foodways. My name is Matt Schumann. I am a, uh, the programming librarian here at Cary Library. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Uh, their support enables us to bring programs like tonight's event to you. I also want to thank Pastor Brent Miracle and Darius Coombs, who is the Cultural Outreach Coordinator for the Mashpee Wampanoag Education Department. Uh, I want to thank them for partnering with Cary Library to make these programs possible. And I also want to thank the Beverly Library for partnering with us on tonight's program. Uh, before I do the intro for Kitty, I just want to uh, mention that we have three other programs in November planned to celebrate Native American Heritage Month. Um, you can sign up for all these on the library's website, carrylibrary.org. I'll put the link in the chat. Um, on Thursday, November 10th, you can meet the author Danielle Greendeer. Uh, this program is for ages five and up. On Saturday, November 12th, we have Wampanoag Crafts. That one will actually be in the library. Uh, it's a hands-on experience for ages five and up uh, in the large meeting room on the lower floor. And then on uh, Wednesday, November 30th, join us for an evening with the Wampanoag Singers and Dancers. That program's also for all ages. Um, uh, if you have any questions, please submit them uh, via the Q&A tonight. Uh, this program is being recorded and will be posted to both libraries' YouTube channels. Uh, now I'm pleased to welcome our speaker tonight, uh, Kitty Hendricks Miller. Um, Ninawita is born and raised a Mashpee Wampanoag tribal citizen and is uh, part of the Otter Clan. Um, she currently is the Indian educa Education Coordinator for the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribes Education, education Department. Uh, she has managed and supervised the Wampanoag Foodways exhibit, exhibit at Plymouth Plantation and was museum manager at the uh, Mashpee Wampanoag Museum. Kitty demonstrates for the public open fire cooking of seasonal sustainable food, though tonight will be virtual and um, different uh, in her kitchen. Um, and she also teaches native craft activities to tribal families at public events. Uh, as a song carrier and musician, Kitty shares her musical gifts and knowledge of traditional Eastern songs and dances with the performing group, the Wampanoag Nation Singers and Dancers, which will be at the library on the 30th. So now, after all that, please welcome the star of the show, Kitty. Winnie Nakon, Katabatash, Matt. Thank you for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Natasuis Nanawita, Kitty Hendricks. I, um, I am born in my bones and blood, the bones from Mashpee. I'll always be Mashpee, but, and I also live in Mashpee, so I'm blessed in that way. So tonight, well, I was asked to do this cooking demonstration, and um, it's quite different for me. I've watched a lot of cooking shows, but the demonstrations I've done in the past have all been over an open fire. So this is going to be a little bit different, but a lot of the things that I'm going to show you, the tools that I use, are the same ones that my ancestors, uh, they're like the ones my ancestors would use back in the 17th century, 18th century, and then takes us through present day with modern tools. Um, so you have the recipe, which is smoked turkey with called the corn, or they call it hominy. And what we're gonna do, I don't know, whoever's gonna start um, 
cooking along with me, we're just going to really saute the onions first and then just put all the ingredients together because I've prepped them so that you can just add them to the pot. But I think we'll go over the list of ingredients first. Um, let's start with corn. She's the tallest and the most buttery of the three sisters. So I have here the um, it's hominy, which is corn that's been soaked in ash overnight and it removes the, the hull and it makes it a shorter cooking time. And this is the hominy after it's been cooked. You have to soak it for at least five to six hours. Overnight's fine. And that's what I did. And then cook it for about 45 minutes to an hour. Now we have in the past, I've had to use this stuff out of the can. I don't recommend it. You can see the difference. It's real white. It's bleachy. Even though this is white corn, this is um, very mushy. And it kind of breaks down when you're cooking it for a long time in a super stew. But of course, you would add it at the last minute, of course. So I have beans. The next companion, the way that we grew our vegetables, they call it companion growing. The Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, called them the three sisters. So this would be the uh, bean spirit. Uh, I have two types of beans. These are my favorite beans. The cranberry bean. They look a lot like pinto beans. I'll bring them over so you can see better. They look like pinto beans. They're soft and they're delicious. They hold, they don't mush, but they make a nice gravy. And um, they're just so buttery and delicious. The other, my next new favorite, actually, I just discovered using these scarlet runner beans in, in salads um, or just by themselves. So this is another bean that we would have used. We had about, I'd say about uh, nine varieties of pole beans. So the scarlet runner bean, it's this one, it's beautiful. And it's nice and firm and meaty. So um, it's a complete protein when you have it along with your corn or if you want to have it over rice. It's quite delicious. So that is bean. And since the cranberry bean after I soaked and boiled it. Always put a bay leaf in your pot when you're boiling beans. And last but not least, the squash, atiquash in the Wampanoag language. And I used, I used Hubbard for the squash today, the winter squash because Hubbard is a, a firmer, firmer texture and it holds up in a soup much better than say your uh, acorn squash. These are just a couple of the types of squashes that we did use. Also, I've used in the past and it's quite delicious, the field pumpkin, the sugar pumpkin. It's really good in soups. And you can also dry the, the pumpkin in rings and put it out in the sun on coals and you could have it throughout the winter and it's, the flavor is concentrated and sugary and delicious. We also, well, we did have the Hubbard squash, the acorn, then the, these gourds were used for different things, not eating, of course, but it is a member of the squash family. So here's our Hubbard squash. And the recipe calls for we can use any meat that you like, but I like the smoky flavor of the turkey. Smoked turkey, or you can use ham if you prefer. I like it to make a little bit of a lighter version um, with the smoked turkey. So these are turkey wings. So we're gonna take the meat off the wings soon. Right. So the first step is to saute the onions in a little olive oil. So it's a great time of year to go to your farmer's market or your local grocer that carries um, backyard vegetables, uh, farm to table vegetables. Oh, here's my knife. I was looking for my knife. It's right around my neck. So we're gonna cut up the onion and it, cut it in coarse pieces, like a coarse, a coarse chop. You don't want the onion to disappear. So I like to keep it in a little coarser. Okay, then we'll put the fire. 
and there is some oil to add to the end here. Add a little bit of oil. I like to use none of the blended olive oils, just the straight California olive oil. It's my favorite. So, chop up the onion and saute it. And when we, what we're going to do is we're going to put all these ingredients together and let it simmer. Um, of course, the turkey's already cooked, but the vegetables won't take long to cook at all. We're just going to, um, the thing that's going to take the longest is the squash. Because the corn has been cooked as well, unless you use the can. And sometimes you you're reduced to having to use the can, just like beans. Uh, I just don't do that anymore because it's just, if you plan ahead to soak, the night before or soak in the morning, go off to work. And um, the longer you soak your beans, the less you have to cook them. So you can come home and actually have it, have some bean sauce for dinner or make a quick little soup with some fresh beans. It's delicious. I'm gonna do a quick coarse drop on these onions. Now, my ancestors would collect onions. They were, they grew wild. And they look a little bit like this. Some people say they look like scallions. So you could reuse, reuse the wild onion. And we also use the wild garlic. And the garlic has already been prepped and put in with, when I cooked the turkey wings to give the, to make your stock. So, Something else I like to add to soup, it's a little different, are your nut meats. I say nut meats because I'm gonna use the meat of the sunflower seed and the, the nut of the walnut, the meat of the walnut. Now we had plenty of black walnut trees and there still are a, a, quite a few around. Um, they were used, we're gonna mash those into a paste to use as a thickener for our soup. Okay, let's put some fire, some fire going over here. All right. So we do have a little, a little of the old and a little of the new for our ingredients and our tools. But the, the idea is always the same. You build your soup with an aromatic, like the onion. And if you want, you could actually add some garlic. It's fine too. You never have enough garlic. Okay, and then we're gonna crush up our nuts. So if you have a mortar and pestle handy, or maybe you have nuts that are already, they're already chopped, maybe you can crush them up a little bit. Sometimes you can use a bean masher, as, just like a pestle. Let's put some onion on. Right. You wanna clean as you go, right? sink. Um, all right, so let's grind some nuts so that'll make our broth nice and thick. So let's do the walnuts first. There's my pestle. This one. And you can find these. If, these are very popular now, all these mortar and pestles. Um, I like the olive wood. It works quite well. Bamboo is good, but it just, it, it's, it doesn't hold up as a wood and it, it dries. But if you um, use walnut oil to um, treat the wood and the wood gets thirsty after so many washes after you use it. So you have to boil it. The walnut oil works quite well. So we're gonna grind, it's almost there. Okay. And I, actually, if you have little ones around, they love this job. They love to grind the nuts. And they'll, they'll start grinding them. Is that good? Then they'll do one more. How's that? They just keep giving them encouragement. It's, cooking is one of the best activities to do with kids. It's just so much fun. All right, so I'm going to check on our onions. On our onion. Mm 
Take it down to the translucent. The fire is a little hot. When you're cooking over a fire, usually use an iron pot. Um, before the Europeans came, we had beautiful clay pots that we used before and after. Actually, we didn't like the flavor that the metal pots kind of ruined the food with a metallic type flavor. Um, this is one of our our pots that we did have. It's a small pot. This would be good for tea. So we'd have stones set beside the fire, just like this. And you take the charcoal from your fire and some twigs and you add and make a nice little fresh fire underneath and set your clay pot on top. Now clay is a great conductor of heat. And if you notice, our pots are not flat on the bottom, they're rounded. And that round shape helps the heat to engulf the shape of this pot. Because this pot is made of clay from the earth. So this is female. And you set it on your stones. And that pot, if you're setting something to boil, it'll boil a good 10 minutes after you take it away from the fire. Now, if you take your metal pan away from the fire, it's just going to cool down right away. And because it's flat, the flame rises and it's greeted by this flat surface, so it goes up and away from where you're, so you're losing a lot of heat. One more minute on those onions. I said if you wanted to add garlic, now would be the time. And while we're doing that, if you want to go ahead and do that, I'm going to finish grinding my walnuts. So we had different size clay clay pots. We have huge ones that you could use for maybe um, a dye bath or just a huge pot. There's always something on the fire because if you had company, it's only polite to offer them upon entering your wee too, would be to offer them a drink, some water or some soup. Soup with sapahik is our word for soup and it was always a soup on the fire or in the sauce or something because there were no set meal times. You could eat any old time you're hungry. And I think that's the way the kids prefer it that way today. So it always seems like the kids are hungry all the time. They're growing, so they need they need the fuel. All right, I think this is good enough. So I'm gonna just cook a little bit. I'm gonna show you the grind. Take my little co-op shell. You want it to be about a little, maybe a little more. You want to make it into a paste. Are we done with again? We are done. So I'm going to add the onions into the um, broth, the, the broth from where you boiled your turkey. Some fire on this pot because I let it cool down when I took, took took it off of the fire, so that the turkey could be set aside on a platter, and you could start deboning it. Okay, so those of you that are grinding, just keep that to the side, and you can add the sunflower seeds to another mortar and pestle. Use the same pestle for that one. Okay. Right, so let's take meat off of the turkey wings. All right. I'm going to move my clay pot so you guys can see my stones. And if I look outside of a smaller one, this could just be used to maybe boil water for tea for one, perhaps. So we're going to take the meat off of this, and we're going to return the meat to the pot. So I'm just going to get another plate with the turkey on. 
So it's nice to have some turkey all year round, really, that turkeys were available. They didn't migrate like the ducks and the geese. You eat a lot of those shore bird, those birds um, in the spring and the fall when they were migrating. We made use of that migration and, and there was plenty of, of duck, to, duck and goose. We also um, would hunt for um, the little birds there that would really work. The little hens that would be great to roast on the fire. Now I'm just going to discard the skin, but if you wanted to save it and maybe make another stock, it seems terrible to waste it, but I, I did, I did, I'm going to. Um, and then we had a lot, lots of vegetables in the diet. All the things that you can gather, like this time of year, uh, everything's pretty much winding down. You're drying a lot of your um, vegetables in the height of the season. So you have dried pumpkin rings and dried squash rings. Um, you'd have to be drying your walnuts, your hazelnuts, sunflower seeds, um, all the berries during the height of the season, which would be now, of course, the cranberries, the sasamaniash, which means the sour berry, the bitter berry. It's the last fresh fruit of the season. And I just happen to have a bowl of them right here. Now I didn't put this on the recipe, but you can certainly add these cranberries or you can make some nice corn dumplings, put the cranberries in the corn dumplings and drop them into your stew at the end, near the end of like the last 20 minutes. That's always a good, a nice treat to have um, dumplings in your stew. Kitty, I'm, I apologize to interrupt. Um, yes. When you have a chance and your hands aren't um, covered in turkey, um, would you mind uh, tilting the camera just slightly down an oh, inch? Oh, you can see more of what I'm doing. Yeah, I think it was fine at first, um, but just for a little bit more detail. Sorry to interrupt you. Don't you know, worry. You're busy with the carcass. Keep on taking it. You don't know. <laughs> All right, so how is that. Oh, that looks better. Yeah, isn't it? Good. that's great. That's perfect. Yeah. I think. Thank you very much. Gone some week, gladly. Um, so I work for turkeys, not home. Now I'm saying these these wampanoag up words, and I I trust that we will not use those because we need to get this language established in our communities. But I feel as if I do need to um, to say the words uh, more. And we just hope that other people just don't take our take our language and take it away from us again. It was gone. It was never gone, but it was asleep. It was underground for, for over 400 years. So we're finally getting it back, we're getting our young ones for it as a, their first language or first speakers. So um, we need to get it going and make it part of all the traditions, the ones that were lost are, are returning to us, which is the way it should be in this in the cycle, right? Everything goes in a circle and comes back. And I think that's what's happening today is that we're going back to the old ways, to what's really important. Just take care of yourself and your family, you know, be a thriving, you know, loving and useful member of your community, care of your neighbors and your family. Uh, ooh, there's a lot of meat on these wings. Wow, look at that. That's a wing and a half. Now, if you use the smoked turkey, it just smells, it fills the air, the delicious smoky flavor. Not too much smoke though, because you want a nice balance with the fresh and the, the fresh, vegetable flavors, the sweetness of the squash and the nutty broth from the nut meats. And you may need, I'm not sure how much water you used or how, how much turkey you used. I used about, I would say about four, four or five pounds. I have about a half of a pot of water. 
But if you need to, you can add some, some uh, prepared broth, or if you have some broth frozen in your freezer, you can use that. Chicken broth is perfectly fine with your turkey. They're both poultries. So the season now, you know, the duck season and the turkey season, hunting season, um, it's a perfect time to, to grill, it's a grill, to put on your spit in the backyard over your fire. If you use an iron spit, of course, it's going to take a shorter amount of time to roast, but you roast the bird whole. You remove, all, you know, you gut it, of course, fuck it. <laughs> um, just put it right on, cut the head off, and move. put it right on a, on a roasting spit. It would take probably a 10 or 12 pound bird would take a, maybe two, two hours, two, three hours. It depends on how much attention you're going to give it. If you're going to be doing something else, you want to keep it high above the fire. But if you're in a rush and you're on it, of course, you can lower the spit. So that's how you regulate the temperatures when you're roasting. Just like you do in an oven, you regulate the temperature. All right, so I'm going to do this last one. I'm not going to do the wing tips, although there is a lot of meat, but I think my cats will get that. And I'm surprised they're not under my feet right now. Because one of my cats knows, just knows when I have meat on a bone. So he's a little spoiled. Sometimes pieces of meat fall to the ground and it's a little treasure. Okay. So while I'm take, deboning these, these wings, I can hear the pots gathering heat and getting, coming to a boil, at which time we will add all of our ingredients. And we'll while the soup is cooking, we can open up to some questions I'd like to share. Um, oh, actually we have a slide, a little uh, presentation called First Farmers and it is um, 17th century uh, growing, gardening, I guess you could say, of, of the vegetables because it was very important to, we migrated to the coast, uh, spent the winter in the, in the the shelter of forest and valleys, and we'd migrate to our our summer site. So we had summer and winter homes. The the summer homes were covered in uh, cattail reed mats, and we right now start migrating back to our winter homes. But with all of our dried vegetables and fruits, um, in the winter the men would start hunting. It's when the animals are at their fattest and their fur is nice and thick, and they're not reading so it's the perfect time to add the red meat to your diet we didn't really eat any red meat throughout the spring summer and the fall because there was just so much else to eat and you don't want to deplete your your protein food source um so that was how it went the men were the life takers and the women are the life givers the men would start their hunting Oh, we've got boiling, we've got boilage. All right, so I'm going to lower the, the heat on that. I'm going to add the squash first. It's the one that's going to take the longest to cook in my stirring pan. So this is a nice little utensil. It's called a stirring paddle. It's just like a paddle in a boat. A boat. And um, has a little piece of deer skin on the handle so that I can hang it up next to the fire or hang it up next to your stove. So throw that in. Great. And then we've got our pile of turkey. Actually there's a little bit more on this plate here. So the men would hunt of course and as they you know they they have their prayers that they do when they take the life of the animal. They they thank bad animals and um, return it to the earth, return what you're not going to use back to the earth. So it was all, it was all um, just different opportunities and different times where you gave thanks for all that's here for you. 
not just a you know certain time one time of the year where you give thanks for this do you give thanks for that well i'm sure you find yourself saying things like oh thank goodness oh thank you so you in 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 that essence are those little, like little affirmations of thank you so not much different from my ancestors that were very very thankful for all the family going all right so this is a nice yeah oh this is my dough bowl by the way it's um one of the the colonist design bowls and it's great for making breads for mixing bread but i used it today to hold meat okay so i'm just gonna it's in the trash oh no the dips or the peat gas. Almost threw it out. So here. Now I'm gonna throw it in the trash. So Oh, it's up to a boil, so I'm going to add the rest of the vegetable. Add to the corn. Just a little bit. It's, it's a little more pretty than the than the beans are, so we're just going to add this. This is um about maybe a little more than half a pound of corn. So lots of cultures have their have corn as their life sustainer. I know that um cazole is a very delicious, delicious dish from the south. Very, very good piece of almond. But I do, I put in a lot of soups and stews. You know, so if you grind that, you can grind the, the corn in your mortar and pestle. Now this is one that's been made the old way. It's a field stone, this smallish one. And then you can see how we use the fire as the main tool to hollow this out, this log. And this is a good size mortar and pestle. I've seen, um, you know, mortars that came up to my waist. They were so big and um, those were used to really grind corn. Because corn is very, you know, it's a hard shell. It's hard. And when it's dried, it's even harder. I have some corn here. We use the northern flint corn. And this is called King Phillips corn. And it's a flint corn. It doesn't have as many rows as cow corn does. There's no nutrition really in, in that in the corn that we eat today. Uh, most of us eat today that you get from the grocery store or the kind that they um, grow around in, in the farms. Um, this is very good. It's, very, it's much more nutritious. And what we do is we would take sharp tool or um, a jar of the, of the deer as a scraping tool. You put it in your mortar and pestle and you grind it down into a meal. Right. Add a little bit. The hominy is for fun. And then you just keep on. This is another chore that the kids love to do. And it can get a little messy because the corn pops right out of the mortar sometimes. That's if you put too much in the bowl. But the men would do all of the tool making and all of the making of the, the bowls and the spoons. Um, so the fire, you start at the top. You take a nice hot coal and you burn it and you move it around and um, to whatever depth you decide you want, however deep you want your bowl to be. And sometimes you can take a shell and just scrape, scrape and burn, scrape and burn, scrape and burn until you get the, the width of the wall. You don't want to burn too. So then you have to start all over again. That would be wasteful. That would be a waste of a tree. So that fire is is doing all the hard work. So that's how um, we would have made bowls, like burls from a tree. 
I do believe this, this is a burl bowl. I got this bowl off of Route 2, but um, to West. I think it's Peterman's or Peterson's burl, burl bowl. It's a nice little place. All right, get to add the beans. I'm going to add the beans, gravy and all. Gives a nice, delicious flavor. And it also thickens the broth. And last but not least, turkey. Oh, you know, you decide you want smaller chunks. Let's just cut up a few pieces here. I'm going to move this mortar out of the way. And I'm going to my handy dandy knife. Cut some more. Put this up a little bit. It'll fall apart too. Um, oh, it smells so good. I love the smell of the smoked meat. So we did smoke over over the fire. You'd um, maybe throw some dried corn cobs on the fire to make it nice and smoky, and then you cover it with some skins. And we'd uh, we would dry and smoke. Herring, you know, the little smokehouses that tribal members still have today. My neighbor has one in his yard. Um, we smoke that herring in the in the spring when they return, and that's uh, signals the Wampanoag New Year, because it's a time of rebirth and time to start growing and osprey return. They they come with the herring and. Spring starts and we start that cycle, that life cycle all over. So we always celebrate then the new year. When the herring come back, it's a signal that, you know, the rivers are still in good shape. They come back from their migration from the ocean into the estuaries. And for us, it's in our, they make their way down Mashpee River, which is the lifeline, it's the river. And they make their journey, mostly at night. Um, when you see the first herring approach, you know it's gonna be spring. And we use the herring. It's one of the fish that we do over. We overfish because there's just so many in such a short amount of time. So we would, we would gather or we harvest a lot of herring and use some for the fertilizer for the ground. If you're, if you're in, one spot for a long time, you need to fertilize the, the soil. Most of us are, right? We don't migrating unless you have a summer house elsewhere or not elsewhere, a winter house. Because why would you go anywhere in the summer and leave this beautiful spot? So uh, we do share our homeland. Everybody that appreciates how beautiful it is here on Cape Cod. Need to stop building right now. Stop the development, please. I think that's true in a lot of places, but mostly Mashpee for a while. In the um, late 80s, I believe, was the fastest growing town um, in New England, if not in the country. That was the beginning of the end for a lot of homeowners and ways, ways that we used to live for it. Became such a hot spot. Okay, we're almost done. Ooh, at the time, we I'm just going to add the rest of this turkey meat, and then we're going to open up for questions. And on um, the slideshow, right, Matt? Yep. Yeah, I have that right. ready whenever you're ready. Yeah, I think about maybe thirty seconds or so. Okay. Okay. This is great. I don't have to do that that kind of work. Fun stuff. Although a lot of people find getting that electronic knowledge and media to be fun. It's much it is needed for sure in today's life, in today's world. I learn a lot from my the younger ones, my granddaughter and the kids at the school. They help. Even the kindergartners know more about technology than I do. All right, Matt, we can start that video, the slide. 
Sure, yeah, let Thank me you. pull it up. This is called First Farmers. Can everyone see that? It's a little, I don't know, it's just my screen. It looks a little small. Hmm. Let's come up close. Do you have the Zoom window uh, full screen? Yes, I don't know. Whoops, just lost it. Sorry. No worries. Well, I'll just stand here. Okay. Oh, Irina says that it looks fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you want me to just uh, say next when you want me to uh, okay. go forward? So this is First Farmers, next. So um, there's all kinds of signs when it's time to plant, but the most evident one in the is the shad bush. When that shad bush blooms, that's the sign for planting your corn. Or next, when, when the oak leaf is about the size of a mouse's ear is another sign. Next. And um, these, this is uh, shots taken on the Eel River in Plymouth. This is, I don't know, probably 35 years ago at Plymouth Plantation. Um, as you can see, the pile of herring, we would always set the herring in the ground. Um, if you can keep the animals away, you'll be on your way to fertilizing. Um, you do it about two to three weeks so they decompose um, before you plan to plant your corn. So the women will go out into the garden because they are the life takers. The men don't step foot in the garden because they're the life takers. I mean, life takers and the women are the life givers. So they're going to give life to the vegetables that we are going to grow in um, our vegetable gardens. Next. And here we are just getting mounding and planting the seed. We would plant about, we do four seeds for the four directions. Sometimes I, I leave one for the crow because the crow feels entitled because he did bring the corn to the people and the beans from the Southwest. So he always plays, he's plays these games. He thinks that us human beings are playing hide and seek with, this, with, the, with the seed, hiding them in the ground. Next. And it's hard for me to see. Yep, then there's gonna keep that, those weeds out. As you can see the mound, so as the corn grows, you mound the dirt around the, the plant to um, support it. So that's how, uh, I think it is, June or July is the mounding month where, you, where that corn is really growing, it grows fast. It's very, very, very hungry. Um, so it takes a, a lot of uh, nutrients from the soil. Next. And actually here she is planting. You have your planting stick. Um, put the stick in about maybe two inches and drop your seeds. And then you move on to the next spot where you, and then you mark that spot, of course, Sorry. with the corn. That's okay. So when the corn's about a hand high, uh, next. Let's see. When it's, it looks like it's a little over a hand high there, but when it's about a hand, Hand high is where you're going to plant your pole beans around the base of the, of the corn. And the beans are going to use the stalk to climb. So that's why we don't use the bush beans, we use the pole beans. Um, they also, the beans also put nitrogen back into the soil. Excuse me, I am going to turn it down. Okay, next. So you can see the beans are, um, you see that's that. that Red is the scarlet runner flower. And then at this point is when you're gonna plant your squashes. Actually, you can plant the squash about the same time as the beans, but the squashes um, have broad leaves. So those broad leaves, they're gonna keep that mound relatively weed free. 
um, and it, it's not going to have a lot of over sun where it's going to promote the weeds to grow and it's going to keep the mounds moist as well so you don't they're not dry and if your mind mounds dry out your corn then the roots are going to be exposed and it, it just won't be very successful next and you see your squash blossoms it's really good time to use those squash blossoms in your soups or you can stuff them with um with some garlic and maybe some ground corn. Um, in the background, you'll see the corn watch tower where, and usually that would be in the center of your garden. And um, each family had about an acre for like a, a family of four, four people. An acre is enough to see you through about a year and maybe into the next year. And you'll have plenty of corn for the next season. But the kids would sit on top of that corn watch tower and they'd play. And you know how playing it gets rambunctious and all that that delightful noise from the kids playing will keep the crows away and the rabbits. Um, so that's their job, another fun job they get to do. Next. And here we are, just tending the garden and uh, using your hoe, what we did. We'd use the shoulder blade of the deer for the for the um, shovel part of the hoe and you know lash it onto a, lo a long stick. You could also use um like for trowel trowels, you could use quahog shells. They're a nice um, hard shell. So and just like the deer bone is very hard, so it makes good tools and um, the quahog shell too. So this is a quahog and there's the seed. So this is a pretty mature quahog. And it's a hard shell clam that we use for um, making soups and stews and jewelry. Next. Okay, so here we are more working in the garden. Actually, that's Danielle Green Deer, who's going to be reading her children's book in a, couple, in a week or so. I didn't pay attention to the dates. Um, so they're getting ready, looks like they're getting ready to harvest. And in the background, you can see one of our summer homes that are, um, are covered with mats that are sown um, from dried cattail reeds. And that covering on that house is, is perfect for, the, for that environment because it's, it's, because you dry it. So it's gonna absorb the moisture that's in the air during the, the spring, summer, and the fall. So it's gonna act like giant sponges covering the frame of the house. And so that's gonna cool down, cool down the inside. Next. And you can see it now all of the, the way every, everything's working together. The, um, the squashes are doing their job and the, the beans are growing. Next. I can't see really. I think I see watermelons maybe. It's really hard for me to yeah, see. Yeah, the, there's a watermelon in yep, there. Yeah, we do the melons, the, the little round, ultra sweet watermelons and that's considered a squash as well. So next, and when it's, um, we, we eat the corn in July, August when it's sweet and it's in the milk stage and it's juicy and um, crunchy and, and wonderful. We would um, roast those uh, soaked ears of corn. We soak them in water and roast them right on the fire um, or, you know, it's time to, to let them dry. And once they're dried, you're gonna braid the husk together braid all these husks together and that way you can hang them for storage. Well, that's what she's doing there. Next. And I think I see some, some squash rings in the background and just a lot of the nice harvest next to the cook fire. And that's a little shade arbor where the women would be tending to the fire, to the cooking, to the children. Um, and be under the shade of nice, some nice pine boughs. So on a home site like that, you'd see several um, shade arbors where um, you could be making tools, um, sewing mats. It was just all, it was a way that we just lived outside and we'd use our houses mainly for sleeping in, in, in inclement weather, or we would use our homes um, as a big bedroom, like storage to store your items to keep them out of the, out of the weather. Next and more of the harvest. I believe there's a nice duck over there and some of the squashes. Um, 
and this is probably September. So of course we didn't harvest in November, which is when the, the big holiday is. Everything's pretty much gone by then. Whoops, what did I do? Oops, I lost it. Okay, next. And this is what the men, they tended and cultivated tobacco. Um, so they did have their own gardens, but they were set quite a ways away on the edge of the home sites, away from the, the life-giving garden. The, the tobacco was used in ceremony. Um, it was an aid in the men's ceremonies and prayers because the smoke from the tobacco would carry all thoughts good thoughts and good intentions and prayers up to the creator. So the men being life takers don't have that direct connection um, because they're not life, life givers. So they would need to have ceremony and use their pipes, which are, would come in two pieces or a nice clay pipe with a nice, um, nice bowl. And they would have peace pipes that piece together you have your stem and then you have your bowl and you put those together. So you have the female and the male uh, come together in that kind of ways. The pipe is very um, sacred, used in ceremony. Next. And they're planting. And you see the vegetable garden is right across the way. So he's planting his tobacco. There were about three um, types of native tobacco that the men used. It's nothing like the tobacco that we see today, the long leaf tobacco. Um, and they'd also use other herbs to mix with that. Next. Oh, yep, and the tobacco's growing and it looks like he's weeding and just tending to that. Next. And that's the tobacco drying. Next. Uh, and that's it. Oh, that was it, yes. Oh, yep. So we have what five minutes for questions, or if anybody has any. Yeah, uh, we've received a uh, lot so far, um, and some comments too. I just want to also say thank you for um, that demonstration. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, so let's see. I'm just trying to turn my video on. Okay. Uh, so one of the questions that we got uh, first was. Where can um, someone find more info on making hominy? They've only seen the Goya brand and they oh. don't like to buy Goya products. Okay, this is my favorite, favorite, favorite place. Um, but please, um, I know there are native owned companies out there, but I haven't, I haven't um, tried enough of them, but where I got this from Rancho Gordo, it's in California and that's where I get all the by beans. Um, so that's a nice company, but please do um, make use of the of native owned businesses. It just so happens that I just don't, that's not where I got the hominy this time. Hominy is, a, is hard to find. So now is the time in the summer. Um, so yes, you can buy it that way, or you can dry your corn and soak it in ash, right? Lye and uh, soak it overnight. You do it your own self. Um, where can uh, someone find smoked turkey legs? Oh, at the local market. I've used the turkey wings, but you do see the legs more often. Um, yeah, it's a hit or miss, but you know, stop. I hate to plug these places, but Stop and Shop has it very has it a lot. Um, I know that's what we have. That's our local grocer here. Um, so check out your local market or maybe you can um, just shop around. Um, what would have been used uh, instead of olive oil originally? Well, we used oils from nuts, sunflower and um, walnut. And of course we would use the grease from animals, mainly um, black bear. Interesting. Black bears have a lot of body fat. And the, the grease, it just, it's, it melts down. It's not cloudy or heavy. Um, and um, it's also good to use on your skin to insulate your skin, to clog your pores. So you could go outside with your arms exposed and be quite comfortable in the cold weather. That's of course, if you're acclimated, um, it takes a while, 
but it is a nice layer of protection. Oh, wow. And that's what we used. But um, you can use Vaseline today. It's, it's, it has a consistency like Vaseline. That's fascinating. I did not know that. Um, there's a question here from someone there, uh, one of the administrators of the Boston Mycological Club. And um, they're curious if uh, your tribe used any local mushrooms in your cooking. You know, I know that a lot of tribal members go mushrooming now. I really haven't come across any recipes um, from the 1700s, but that doesn't mean there weren't. Mm -hmm. um, and family recipes, that's pretty much what I go by. Mm -hmm. um, step over here for one second. And this family recipe book, as you can see, it's been through the ringer, but all the basic recipes from my family, the Hendricks family, um, are in, in this book. And I use it just for your basics, like your fish cakes with beans, cornbread. Um, they're all in here. Um, and I don't, there are modern recipes with mushrooms, but I haven't, I haven't seen any. But like I said, it doesn't mean they weren't there because if it was edible, my ancestors probably used it. Sure. That's a very, that's a really nice compendium there too. That's a great collection. Um, there's a question here that says, um, thank you so much for this presentation. Love to learn about the first farmers. Do you still garden in that fashion nowadays? Interesting how the animals partake in the tools too. Oh, right. Um, if I had more space, because uh, you need a good, good amount of space, at least, you know, eight by 10, or if not more, because you don't want to, plant in a square. You know, you want to keep it everything circular for your garden as well. Um, but I've done, sometimes I'll just do corn and um, I'll do maybe two or three mounds, but uh, I haven't really been successful only because I don't have my own space to do that. But I, a lot of um, tribal members do still grow in that, use that tradition. And I, a lot of schools are reaching out to set up their gardens. So I do a lot, actually I do a lot more work in other people's um, gardens than I do in my own. I, you know, I grow lots of modern things like tomatoes, cilantro, that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, you really need to have some really good soil and you need to keep that fertilized year after year. Yep. Mm. Um, there's also some questions if uh, people can see what the stew looks like, but I don't know if it's quite ready yet. It is. Oh, you know what I did? Add, didn't add the nut meat. That's okay. Oh, this came out really good. So if you um, like, you can use if you want something green, feel free to throw in some some green beans and stuff. But I was just trying to keep it seasonal. Um. So I'm gonna move out a dish. Let me see. Perfect. And actually, let's drop some cream in this one. They don't take very long to get soft. Spoon here. So here is the stew. Wow. How many people made the stew while we were, we were connecting tonight? Curious to see how you like it and how it came out. Oh, the harmony and the beans together is so good. It looks wonderful. I, not to be a pest, but do you mind just holding it just slightly closer oh, sure. to the camera? Yeah. Just so I wish that I could, you know, allow the yeah, Zoom overhead. audience to smell it as well. But no, right? Wouldn't that looks, be cool? It looks very sure good. They're going to come out with that someday. There was a question actually that just came through. Do people, uh, do you use salt in, uh, in the cooking? Well, um, my ancestors didn't. The only salt they had in their diet was from the briny flavor of the shellfish. Yeah. Uh, no, there wasn't no salt and there wasn't any sugar either. 
So the only sugar that they would have had was uh, cane maple sugar. And they'd get that um, when they would travel up north or if they would um, trade, like with the Penobscots and the um, Abenaki peoples. Um, they would they loved our corn because we had a nice long growing season. So and we loved their maple sugar. Um, so at that time, <laughs> before we assimilated, we were very healthy people. The average height for a Wampanoag male was about six feet. So um, because there was no sugar and not a lot of fat, just the fat from the bear and the deer and the, you know, the animals eaten in the winter, of course, when you're going to burn a lot of that fat off. Um, so very, very healthy um, with the vegetables. The vegetables comprise more than 75% of the diet. Um, so it was more vegetables and, and fruits and nuts than it was proteins uh, because of the corn and the squash and the beans together. Um, so no, I did not use any salt here. Actually, I did salt the beans after I cooked them, but of course you can salt to taste also sure. with fresh pepper. Great. Well, um, we are uh, at eight o'clock. I, I don't want to take up uh, more of your time, but thank you so much for uh, this demonstration tonight and all the uh, education you've provided about the Wampanoag uh, history and culture. You're welcome. You're very welcome. And thank you. And I'm going to say Pish Kananamu, which means we'll see you later. Uh, there's no word for goodbye in our language. So Pish Kananamu. <laughs> Pish Kananamu. Have a good night, everyone. Uh, this this program uh, was recorded and will be on the library's uh, YouTube page. And uh, I'll send out the recipe again. But thank you so much, Kitty. You're welcome. We can't the moon. Have a good night, everyone.